our uh, next lecture is going to be on FSM concept. So finite state machine concepts. So this discussion on finite state machine is actually uh, split up into two lectures. One is concepts, the other is design. So the design of finite state machines will uh, look a lot like the uh, design of the counters, but with, with a little bit more complexity. So counters are actually finite state machines, um, but they are the simplest kind of finite state machines. And we are, we are, we are actually going to build on uh, those design procedures. Okay, so let's see here. Let's talk about why it's why the name finite state machine. What does that mean? Finite state machines. Highlight each word. Why use the word finite? Why use the word state? And why use the word machine? What is the significance of using those three words? Well, it's called finite because they are finite number of states. When we drew the state diagram of our counter, we had uh, what, seven circles, right? So those circles were indicating states and those were finite in number. So finite number of states. What is the next term? State. State actually just indicates the current outputs. Of all flip-flops. Right? State 0, state 1, state 2, state 3 and so on. We, we labeled that as cap S sub zero, one, two, three, and so on. Those states were uh, different only because the outputs at a particular time for all the flip-flops were different at that time. So the word state just indicates that the current outputs of all the flip-flops uh, being different. Right. So it goes from one state to the other. That's the machine. So what is machine? Go from one state to the other. To the other depending on inputs and actually the sequence of inputs, right? Sequence of past inputs. So these machines uh, could be of two types. And all the terminology will come in later. But the machines could be in two types because one type of machine is only dependent on the sequence of past inputs. That means only the previous states dictate what the next state is going to be. The other type of machine could be that the, the output outputs depend on both inputs as well as the past sequence of inputs. So there's one machine that only depends on the sequence of past inputs or history. The other machine is dependent on both inputs, current inputs and the, the previous state, which means sequence of past inputs. So there could be two types of machines there uh, and we'll talk more about those as we go through so that's that's the that's the uh, that's the terminology that we are using finite state machine finite because the number of states we are dealing with is finite state indicates the uh, the outputs of all the flip-flops machine is because it's going from one state to the other depending on inputs and or or uh, 
well, it cannot simply depend on inputs. It has to have some memory. So it either depends on sequence of past inputs or it depends on sequence of past inputs and the current inputs, the present inputs. So that's your machine. Finite state machines are also clocked, called as the clocked synchronous sequential circuits. And it is pretty easy to see why they are called synchronous sequen clocked sequential uh, synchronous sequential circuits that is because all the storage elements flip-flops are triggered by the same clock source right so all the flip-flops are because they are triggered by the same master clock signal that means that they all change state together which is what we did in our uh, counter design we actually when when there was a positive edge trigger on our clock, all the three flip-flops in our three-bit counter change the state at the same time. So they were in sync with a master clock signal. So that's why the finite state machines are called synchronous sequential circuits. Um, they're all edge triggered flip-flops. Where are the edge triggered flip-flops present? Well, in this diagram, the flip-flops are going to be present in this block right here, storage elements. And, you know, I should probably draw uh, an additional uh, input here because there is a clock, right? So where is that clock? The clock is right here. And I should say this to be clock. So the only block here that is being uh, clocked is the storage elements block. So those are where the flip-flops are. Everything else is a combinational network. So you have certain inputs coming in to a combinational network, which also has some feedback through the flip-flops. So the output of, some of the outputs of the combinational network are the state, the next state. So that's, that's uh, those are, those outputs actually control uh, the storage elements. The current state is fed back into uh, the combinational network here. And depending on the current state and the inputs, you, you figure out the outputs. So the outputs depend on uh, the current state and they could also depend on the inputs. Right. So I'm going to say this. Outputs here, they are coming from here right, the combinational network. And based on the diagram that you see here, you can deduce outputs over here depend on two things, right? One is that guy and the other is that guy. So, one possibility is the outputs depend on both inputs and the current state. And the other possibility is outputs depend on current state. Um, is there another possibility here? Outputs depend on inputs. Uh, would we would we discuss that? Would is there any need for me to discuss that? Outputs depend depend only on inputs. Should I discuss that now or there's no need for me to discuss that now? So I, I, I am looking for some discussion on this because this can uh, be slightly confusing. Why? why so there are two things that are controlling the output, right? One is the current state of the flip-flops and the other is the inputs. For a counter, we didn't have inputs. We just had the current state. But now I'm saying there are some out inputs that go into a combinational network. The output of the combinational network is the outputs or it could be the next state going into the inputs of the flip-flops. So my question is, if the outputs depend on two things here, indicated by these two blue arrows, 
I am saying that there are only two things I need to worry about outputs depending on the current state and outputs depending on both the current state and the inputs. So let me highlight that in blue, both current state and the inputs. Right. So my question is, should I worry about outputs depending only, only on inputs now? Should I worry about that now or I have already worried about it earlier in the course? Should I call this slide sequential in that case? Should I call this synchronous in that case? If outputs only depend on inputs? Mm. All right, so let's let's start. No, it should be combinational. Absolutely right. So if outputs depend on inputs, that means this is a combinational network, right? There is no memory. There's no there's no state. There's no sequential element to this. If outputs only depend on inputs in that case. So if outputs depend on that inputs, we have done multiplexers, we have done encoders, we have done logic gates, we have done all those things at the beginning of this course. I don't need to spend any more time on that. I'm more interested in sequential, synchronous sequential circuits. So that's why over here, because there is memory involved using the storage elements, uh, my outputs can only be classified as two things. One type of outputs depend on current state, the other depend on inputs and current state. So you guys are absolutely right. If outputs depend only on inputs, it should be called combinational logic, which we have already spent good amount of time in this course for. All right, so let's let me um, actually write those statements here. Uh, let's see. So the question here is not related to this. The question here is, uh, what do outputs depend on? So, you know, maybe a better question is, when do outputs change? When do outputs change? Question mark. Outputs could change when um, inputs change. When inputs change. or current state Q, right? Let's call this Q, let's call this Q plus. Q changes. So that's one type. And the other type is outputs could change. Let me write the other one in blue. Outputs could change when Q changes, current state changes. Because current state is fed back into a combinational network that drives the outputs. So as you can see here, that those two, that's the classification, right? One is outputs could change when inputs change as well as uh, Q changes, this or this, right? And the other is outputs could change when Q changes. So let's talk more about this right now. Outputs could change when inputs change or Q changes. When does Q change? Q is the output of a flip-flop or in, in combination of many flip-flops, 
it could be you know outputs of many flip-flops but when does that change that only changes at the active edge of the clock but this type of finite state machine which is actually called mealy state machine mealy fsm where the outputs could change when inputs change or q changes we know that q changes only at the active edge of the clock but there is no such restriction on the inputs. Input could change any time, which means the mealy FSM outputs could change at any time, which is why mealy FSM is an asynchronous FSM. The outputs do not wait for the clock. They can change any time because the outputs could change when inputs change. But the other one over here, which is called Moore FSM, this is the simpler type, Moore FSM, outputs could change when Q changes. So they only depend on the changes of the flip-flop outputs, which only happen at the um, with respect to the clock, either positive edge or negative edge. So these are synchronous in nature. The outputs are synchronous with respect to clock. For melee, the outputs may not be synchronous with clock because they change the moment inputs change because of this particular arrow, right? Inputs dictate changing the outputs immediately more about these finite state machines as we go through but that's that that's where we are talking about um, is there any memory involved in the combinational network here there's absolutely no memory there right no feedback no memory these this is combinational block all the memory is over here using flip-flops All right, questions here? Now, you know, for, for many students, um, the following uh, slides are probably the most uh, interesting uh, in, in the entire course because they relate digital design to real examples, which can be very, very interesting. So we'll be looking at some fi uh, finite state machine examples here. One is of the vending machine, one is of the elevator, and another one for a computer. Right now we are just not uh, you know, doing the design, we are just going to be talking about how we are going to be designing these finite state machines. So we'll, we'll start off with the concept here and then we'll move into the design aspects. So for a vending machine, which is also a finite state machine, the inputs could be coins and buttons, right? So the vending machine um, gives you some uh, item when you give it some coins and push certain buttons. The outputs can be uh, the change that remains like a few coins and the outputs of this vending machine could be food, right? Like the item that you are interested in. For an elevator problem, elevator finite state machine, the inputs could be uh, buttons that you press inside or outside the elevator and the sensors that are keeping track of where the elevator is. The outputs could be uh, lights that go on and off depending on uh, the, the motion of the elevator and motors that actually control the movement of the elevator. For a computer, which is, which is also a finite state machine, it is probably the most complicated finite state machine. The inputs are what? Keyboard, network, memory, disk. So all those are inputs to the finite state machine called the computer. The outputs are uh, a display, a monitor, a network. And over here, the microcontroller, which is invisible to the user here, 
says what connects to what at each cycle. So the, the, the computer, if we think of the computer as the final state machine, it is moving from one state to the other depending on those inputs. But that job is being handed to the microcontroller to do that. Um, it's actually the control unit of the computer that is managing all of this. Uh, so you know, instead of thinking about it as the computer, I should probably say control unit, right? Control unit of a computer is what is the uh, finite state machine that we are talking about here. So it moves the computer from one state to the other. So right now I am doing uh, some ALU operation. I'm adding right now. Um, I am displaying something on the monitor right now. So it's moving from one state to the other, depending on the inputs that come in. All right, so we will be um, discussing these ideas in just a minute. Now, let's talk about the first idea here of an odd parity checker, right? Odd parity means what? Odd parity means if the number of ones that you have uh, observed are odd, then activate the output. So you can say assert output which means make output one, whenever the input bit stream has odd number of ones, right? Um, so uh, let's kind of take a look at uh, this. If suppose your input is here, input is here, and your output is here. If your input is of uh, this sequence, Zero one one zero one zero one zero zero one. What should be the output of this particular odd parity checker? So soon after it sees the first zero, a little bit after that, should it become a one? Should it become zero? What should it become? Uh, let's t take a look at the statement again. Assert output, make the output one whenever the input bit stream has odd number of ones, right? So right now, at time zero, you only have one bit, which is zero. Oh, okay, so you... <laughs> I don't know yet. So Kevin has already put out the answer, but I don't know that yet. He has done it uh, way too quickly. So I'm going to say this, right? After we see the first zero, my output is going to be zero because it is not a uh, odd parity yet. But after I see the first one, I'm going to make the output one here because now I have seen one one odd number of ones. But I, once I see the second one, I've gone back to even number of ones. So I've, I've gone back to even. And I'm still even. Now I'm odd. I'm still odd. Now I'm even. Now I'm uh, even. So even. Even and odd. You guys see that? So one, zero, one. All right, so it looks like, yes, Kevin, you're right. Your sequence matches this. So that would be the output, right? This is the input bit stream here at the top. So as the bits keep coming in, a little bit later, because the, the, you know, the output will change after a little bit of delay. So, the inputs come in on this bit line sequ uh, serially, right? Zero, one, one, zero. So those are coming in as a bit stream on one wire. The outputs will keep changing depending on which bit comes in. So after the first one, it will change to zero because it is not odd parity. After the second bit comes in, we get odd parity. If the third bit, we get even parity. So we go back to zero and so on. Questions here, how we have sketched 
uh, input versus output for this uh, art parity checker. So think of this as a box which is doing the art parity checker and you have inputs coming in and you have output here. So these guys are coming in sequentially this way and the outputs are being observed here. Okay, let's go back to this. My states right now are only two states because the output, you know, I can, uh, since I'm checking for odd parity, the output can be in one of two states. One is I'm in even parity or I have odd parity right now, right? So the finite state machine typically starts off with reset. So there is an input that is reset. When pressed, you come to this default state. The default state over here is even parity. And when you are in this even parity state, your output is zero because we don't want this to detect even parity. We want it to detect odd parity, right? So when you are in even parity state, your out, this is the output by the way. And this is the output here. And the blue one is the state. That's the current state. So you, we could be in either in even state or in odd state. When you are in even state, you are outputting a zero. When you are in the odd state, output, you are outputting a one. And it looks like the outputs are dependent only on the current state which means this is a Moore finite state machine here, right? Because we said there are two types, Milli and Moore. Right now, I have associated st current state and output together. They are in the same state. So outputs are dependent on the current state only, which is why I'm calling this a Moore finite state machine. But more about that later. All right, let me erase these things and talk about this. Actually, let's leave it there. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this very clearly, but suppose you are in even state, right? And if you keep getting zeros, what should happen? Well, you stay there, right? This is called a self loop. It's called a self loop. That means if you are in even par if you are outputting a even parity right now, the number of uh, ones in your bit stream currently are even. And if you keep getting more and more zeros as the inputs, these are the inputs. Actually reset is also an input. So the, the yellow highlights are the inputs. So if you are in even state and you keep getting zeros, you will stay in the even state, right? That's the self loop there. But if you are in even state and you get a one, you will go to the odd state. There has to be two arrows coming out of the state because when you are in one particular state, there are only two possibilities for the new input. It could be a zero, it could be a one. So there should be two arrows coming in, coming out of each state. If it is zero input, you stay there, you stay at the even state. If it is odd, uh, sorry, if it is one, you come to the odd state. Now suppose you are in the odd state, the same two possibilities happen again. It, the new input could be a zero, could
could be a 1. If it is 0, then you are not changing parity, which means, again, you have a self loop. You stay in the odd state. If you get a 1, you go back to the even state. Right? So we have this sketch is actually very, very, very helpful in designing this finite state machine. Coming up with a state diagram as shown over here is probably the most uh, complex aspect of finite state machine design process. Once you get to a state diagram, after that everything will be smooth because it will be very systematic. It will be step after step which we have already, which we, you know, most of those elements we have already uh, figured out. Yeah, right like excitation tables of flip-flops and so on. So coming up with the finite state machine state diagram is, uh, you know, the, the crucial aspect of this. Why did we choose two states for the output? Why did we choose, uh, how did we draw these arrows? Um, so all the sketching of the state diagram is the crucial aspect. So depending on which example you are looking at, it might be a different type of state diagram, which is why we are going to uh, walk through many such uh, examples. All right. Now, using this state diagram, I have written out a symbolic, why symbolic? Because you see, I'm not, I, I, I'm using symbols even and odd here, so symbolic. Symbolic state transition table. Something like what we did in even in the counter design example. We just didn't have outputs there. We had present state and we had next state. Now, for finite state machine, we have two more columns. One is the input, the bit stream coming in, and the output, the odd parity checker output, right? So the, the present state and the next state was already there in our um, counter uh, exercise. So. If you are in even state, right? If your present state is even and you get an input of zero, what sh what is your next state? Well, if you are in even state, you are right here and you get a zero, you stay in the even state. So the next state is also even. And in that particular state, output is zero as indicated by these square brackets. That is zero. Output is zero present state input, these are two things essentially functioning as inputs. So there will be four possibilities in here, right? So there will be four possible combinations between present state and input. What are those? Even zero, even one, odd zero, odd one. So when you are in even state right now, present state is even and you get a one, right? That's that arrow there. You go to the odd state and your output, which depends only on the present state, that is crucial here. Output depends only on the present state. Hmm, let me not highlight it like this. Let me highlight it like this. Output depends on present state. Why is that? Notice where we have written the output, zero and one here in square brackets. Where did we write that? We married the output to the state it is in, present state, even and odd. So output depends on present state. So even, even, odd, odd translates to zero, zero, one, one. So what does the other thing depend on? Next state depends on present state as well as input. Next state depends on present state as well as input. If you are in even, you get a zero, you st stay at even. If you are at even state, you get a one, you move to odd state. If you are at odd, you get a zero, you continue to be in odd state. If you are at odd, you get one, you move to the even state. So from the state diagram, you go to the symbolic state transition table. And from the symbolic state transition table, you can actually go to the state transition table. All you have to do is associate even with a zero 
an odd with a one. So if I associate even with a zero and odd with a one, uh, this will become zero, zero, one, one, and this one will become, uh, let's see, zero, one, one, zero, right? And instead of calling it next state, I will simply call this ns and present state ps. And I will call my input um, w and I'll call my output z. Some variables. So with this, can you guys help me uh, write an expression for output z? What is the expression for output z? logic expression for output z depending on this state transition table you of course have to uh, write z in terms of ps and w so what would be the expression here z equals what It's not that hard. PS, yes. You see, this column out, this column right here, Z matches present state, 0, 0, 0011, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. Output is present state. Output equals present state, right? Output equals present state. Okay, 0, 0, 0011. All right, so that's one. What would be the expression for next state? ns equals what? In terms of ps and w, what is next state? Is that okay? Exclusive OR operation, right? This is this is kind of like a traditional truth table, right? Zero 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 one one zero one one, and the output right now is next state zero one one zero. That's an exclusive OR relationship. So next state equals present state exclusive OR, the input W. Now next state is what? Usually I indicate next state with Q plus and I indicate present state with Q. So next state, which is Q plus equals Q exclusive or W. That's where we are at using the symbolic state transition table. Now, let us try to talk about how do I get this Q plus and Q, um, how do I implement this? Now the simplest way to implement uh, flip-flops is to use a D flip-flop. Because a D flip-flop has the characteristic equation Q plus equals D whatever I need on the um, current state, sorry, whatever I need on the next state, make that your input, D, and that's it. That's the D flip-flop uh, characteristic equation. So if you wanted the next state to be Q exclusive or W, then you can simply make, use a D flip-flop and say, Q plus equals D. So drive the D input of the flip-flop by taking the exclusive R of its output and the new input. All of these again we will see in just a bit. Alright, so we have we have done a lot of 
things here. Let's kind of quickly recap this. For, from symbolic state transition table, we are going to move to an encoded state transition table, which is to provide an encoding scheme between the symbols even and odd, and the encoding can be of the form 0 and 1. So on the top here, we have the symbolic state transition table that comes from directly from the state diagram. And then after we use the state encoding where we have used in, we have where we have encoded even with zero and odd with one, we write the encoded state transition table as such 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 for the input. The next state is uh, even odd odd even 0 1 1 0 and output is 0 0 1 1 right um, often the encoding is not so obvious which means that you, you know depending on how you encode things uh, you may end up with a different cost of implementation more gates as well as less gates so there you will often find that uh, with uh, finite state machines you will have many solutions to one design problem because uh, the encodings are uh, arbitrary. All right, let's uh, move on here. So state diagram to state symbolic state transition table to encoded state transition table. What's next? What the next step is to write e equations for next state and the output. So the output, as we discussed earlier, output Z was equal to present state. So that that's uh, what we are sketching over here. And we are simply calling the output of the D flip flop as our Z, right? That's what we call Z here. That's our Z. So that's what indicates whether you got a, a odd parity or even parity at that particular moment. And then we are using D flip flops to implement this. And for D flip flops, we said Q plus equals D. So all I have to do is drive the D flip flop input with whatever I need as the current state, uh, whatever I need as the next state. What do I need for the next state? Earlier we said Q plus equals Q exclusive or W. Earlier we said that. So if I simply drive the D flip flop with this Q plus, which is present state exclusive or the input W, I'm done. And how am I doing that? Well, I simply take output here what is the output output is z and it's also the q right it's also the current present state i take the present state feed it back into an exclusive or gate with the input w that will give me my d and that's what i'll i'll drive the d flip flop with so that after the next positive edge of the clock here i'm going to get q plus equal to W exclusive or uh, PS. And then I have a active low reset input, which we are not using at this moment, but it is a clocked, uh, clocked D flip flop. Now you could have implemented this using a T flip flop as well, because you know, if you know the relationship between the output and the input to the uh, flip-flop, you can choose whatever type of implementation you want. D flip-flop probably was the easiest, but we know that a D flip-flop with an exclusive R actually is like a T flip-flop. So we, we, we could have used a T flip-flop as well, right? And over here, input and output of the T flip-flop are related uh, by simply connecting input to the T input. So let's see if that actually works out here. Input is right here, 0, 1, 0, 1. And my output is right here, 0, 0, 1, 1. So if I want the input here to go to output like that, and I'm trying to use the um, T flip flop. What do I do? I have don't toggle there, toggle there, toggle there, don't toggle there. 
right? A a as simple as that. So when your input is uh, one and your present input is present state is zero, that's when, what, hold on. So if you have your input, if your input goes into the T flip flop and you have a positive edge on the clock, your output is going to give you, right. So if your input is zero and you have the positive edge of the clock, you are essentially saying don't toggle. So present state and next state are the same. And when input is one, you are toggling. So zero becomes a one. The input is zero, you are not toggling. One stays a one and your last state is input is one, which means you are toggling, one becomes a zero. So you are able to do this by keeping track of present state and next state. Now coming back to this, the behavior of the finite state machine. On the top here, like we chose an arbitrary input bit sequence, over here, the timing waveform of another arbitrary bit sequence is provided. So the input is here, 100, 110, and so on. And the clock, at a much uh, faster rate than the input, is shown as well. So what is it going to do? Well, it is going to observe things only at the positive edge of the clock. Why? Because I have a positive edge of the uh, positive edge uh, flip-flop implementation. So it's going to observe what is the input at that time and at that time and at that time and at that time and so on, right? So at the first positive edge, your input is a one. That means now you are going to have odd parity. That means the output will become one. The next positive edge, your input is zero. So that means you are still at odd parity. Output is one. The next positive edge, your input is zero, still odd parity, output is one. The next positive edge, out input is one, that means now you have two ones, even parity, it becomes zero, and so on. All right, so that's essentially how we have uh, sketched uh, an arbitrary input clock and output to show the behavior of this odd parity checker finite state machine. Now let us ask a question uh, which is slightly uh, interesting. What if my input did this? What if my input did this? Here it stayed at zero, here it stayed at one, but instead of going from one to zero slowly, it did this. If if my input did that, would my output change here? No, it will not change here because now I have I have made the input change between the positive edges of the clock, which are ignored by this implementation. But is this right? Depending so. But is the output going to be right in that case? For an odd parity checker exercise, is the output correct in terms of the application? You had one here, right? It was supposed to be doing one here, became zero, it became another one, it became another zero. So right now you had Two, two ones, right? So it should have been even parity. You are showing odd parity here. So even the, 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 the output is sort of incorrect, right? Because it's not, it's not 
uh, actually doing the art parity checker. So it this tells me two things. One is if I my clock rate, I think assuming that the okay. Charles says, assuming that the blip in the input is noise and there is a fixed bit rate, then it would still be correct. So what if it's not noise? What if it was it was an input that happened fast, right? So the bit rate was fast, almost comparable to the clock. What happens then? Then I may get incorrect results, right? The point that I'm trying to make is that I would probably want to choose a much faster clock rate than the input. The inputs are coming from humans, right? So those tend to be much slower than the clock signal. The clock repeats at 100 megahertz, uh, one gigahertz, like it, it's a much faster um, so, uh, much faster signal than the input itself. So the input can be slow, but the clock has to be much fast, uh, much, much faster than the input so that I don't miss those uh, ones in the middle. All right. So th that's kind of how the input and the clock are uh, in terms of their speed are related. The other point is that if I choose a particular clock rate and a particular input, the output of the finite state machine doesn't really matter what the input does in the middle. As long I only observe the output at the positive edges of the clock. So no matter what the input does in the middle, I, I ignore that, right? Because it's an edge trigger device. Bottom line is, I have to choose the clock rate to be much faster than my input rate. If I had chosen a much faster clock rate, I would have picked up both these ones here at the beginning. Questions, discussion about this? Okay, let's move on. So th the things that we talked about are uh, summarized over here. Uh, it doesn't matter how often the input changes, it matters what the input is on each rising clock edge. Um, but an underlying uh, detail is that if the clock is the only way to compensate or the only way to uh, make sure that the output is actually doing the correct thing, right? Like the odd parity checking, um, I have to make the clock rate much faster than the input. And if I do that, fast input faster than the users can press it or stop the pressing. So the, the, the clocks are much faster than the slow, uh, the inputs. So if I'm uh, taking care of the clock rate, um, making it fast enough, then um, I, I'll be getting the correct output, even though I'm just looking at the input at that clock edge time. All right, let's uh, move on to the next slide, which is a classification of these two type of finite state machines. So we have already introduced uh, this idea of the fact that the finite state machines could be of two types. Uh, one in which the outputs depend only on the current state and the other in which the outputs depend on current state as well as the current inputs, right? So uh, those two types of uh, finite state machines, one is called Moore, one is called Mealy. The one that we designed just now was Moore state machine because you see outputs depend only on the current state. Z depends only on the present state. Z equals PS, right? So Z only depends on PS. 
that was the Moore state machine. Uh, other type of state machine is Mealy, in which outputs depend on current state, also on the current inputs, W. Um, we have not designed a Mealy state machine yet. Moore is called a synchronous uh, finite state machine because the outputs can change when the there is a state change on the clock edge. So far, we have only seen Moore here. And Mealy state machines are asynchronous in nature because the outputs can change whenever the inputs change. Right? As soon as the input change, output can change. Um, and they, all, they can also change when the state changes as well. So inputs and outputs are written, in this case, on the arcs or on the, the arrows in the state diagram. So in, in, Moore, in Moore, you will see the state and you will see the output right here. And in the Mealy machine, you will see the outputs written on the arrows. So as to indicate that the outputs are dependent on the state as well as the inputs. So inputs and outputs both will be on the, uh, on the uh, arrows. one particular type of input caused a transition. We will take uh, a look at all, all these things um, in more detail as we go through this. So let's take a look at the state machine structure for Moore. For Moore, uh, you have your inputs driving the combinational logic here, the next state logic here. This is combinational that is sequential, that's the state memory, and then another uh, choice of output combinational logic here. So here there is uh, combinational here, and this is sequential, and this is combinational again. Right. So inputs come in, you have feedback between the current state and the, the combinational logic that drives the, the next state, the sequential elements are clocked by a master clock signal as indicated here. The combinational uh, logic blocks do not have any clock input. They do not have any feedback. Only the state memory, the, the, the sequential parts are what for which there is memory, uh, there is feedback. And, you know, you don't have to have a lot of combinational elements here and here. These are options, right? So depending on the type of finite state, the, the, the finite state machine design, you may have some or none. So for example, um, in our previous finite state machine, we didn't have any logic G, right? Because output was directly the current state. Output Z was PS. So for this particular block here, we didn't have anything at all in our previous example. And if we choose the state memory to be uh, uh, synthesized using a D flip-flop, in our previous example, we, ha we had exclusive OR, right, exclusive OR gate. If this was D flip-flop, those three are indicative of the example that we just did, right? We had none for output logic G. We had an one exclusive OR gate for logic combinational logic F, and we had a D flip flop. So, for example, if I so just to show you how it fits, if I go back and take a look at this, you see we used D flip flop. Output Z was present state, so no combinational logic after the output of the flip-flop there, but between the input and the flip-flops, there was an exclusive OR gate there. So that, that's what, that was what the combinational logic was, F was. Now, we also did the other way, right? Where this was none, this was T, and this was none. That was using the T flip-flop. So my point being, that those combinational logic blocks F and G are optional, right? They, they don't have to have uh, 
gates, there could be none or there could be some complicated combinational logic as well. It depends on the machine that you are designing. Uh, the, the state memory, that is the sequential part of this finite state machine, typically is designed using D flip-flops because that's pretty easy to design using because of the nature, Q plus equals D, right? The next state is what the whatever the input drives. So typically edge trigger D flip-flops. Now, coming back to why is this Moore? This is a Moore design because outputs only depend on the current state. There is no wire like this. There is no connection here or here. Right? There is no connection here or here. Which means that outputs are not dependent on inputs. There is only a connection between outputs and current state depending on the output logic G. Hence, this would classify as a Moore machine in which the outputs can only change after the positive or, or the edge triggered flip flops change the current state. Now, in terms of, uh, hold on, all right, let's keep moving. Um, Moore machine state diagram. How are we going to draw a state diagram for this particular Moore machine? We are trying to design a vending machine that takes in nickels and dimes and sells an item costing 15 cents. And when you're trying to design a finite state machine, you have to spend good amount of time trying to uh, make some reasonable assumptions. Right. You have to take care of uh, all the possibilities. So such assumptions for this particular state diagram include if you pay two dimes, the vending machine is going to keep the change. So it's a little bit greedy here. So if you pay it 20 cents, it's going to keep the five cents. Um, but it, it, it will sell you the item costing 15 cents. We are going to ignore the clock in this example and we are going to assume that the transitions between one state to the, occur, uh, to the other occur when you insert a coin. So imagine a, 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 a vending machine and as you uh, insert coins, it is transitioning between the states. And once it reaches the state in which it is ready to give you the item, it will activate a certain motor that will release that particular item for you to grab. Right. Um, so we are ignoring the clock and we are making within and we are assuming that the transition happen uh, depending on when you we insert the coin. And also an assumption is we must hit reset to restart the machine after it wins an item. So 15 cents per item, the machine takes in nickels and dimes. So there are many ways to do this, right? Uh, one way could be the user puts in three nickels. Uh, another way could be the user puts in two dimes in which the user loses five cents. The other way could be one nickel, one dime, or the other one could be one dime and then nickel, right? So there are multiple possibilities here to get that item. Um, but we have to keep track of these assumptions. Must hit enter, must hit reset to restart. Transitions happen only when you insert a coin. And when you hit, give it 20 cents, it keeps the five cents. It keeps the change. Now let's try to put all of this together. How many states do we need? At least we need four states at the minimum. Where are those states? I have zero cents with me. The vending machine has five cents. The vending machine has 10 cents. The vending machine has 
15 cents. When it has 0 cents, it does not, let me use a different color here. When it has 0 cents, it does not give you anything, no item, no item, no item, there it gives an item. So the output, which is within the state, that's why it's called the Moore machine, right? Because the output depends on the present state. Zero indicates no item. One in the square bracket indicates that there is an item that is to be vended. So when you are in zero state, you could go to five cents state in which the vending machine holds five cents by putting in a nickel. Or from zero, you could have given it a dime and you jump to the third state here. From zero, they will, there should be from the state zero here, which in which it has zero cents, there should be two arrows that are going out depending on N and D, right? One is N going down. When you give it a nickel, it goes to five cents. And when you give it a dime, it goes to 10 cents state. However, if you do not give it nickel and dime, where does it go? No nickel, no dime, it stays there, right? So you're not, um, you're not giving it anything. Or you keep pressing reset, you stay there, right? So you, you press reset, you come here, or you press reset from any other state, you go back to that, zero cents. Now, if you go to five cents, Again, we need to talk about what happens when you put an in, in a nickel, what happens when you put in a dime. If you put in a nickel, you go to the state which 10 cents, and when you put in a dime, you go to the 15 cents state. If you do not put in any nickel and dime, you stay there. You stay in the 5 cents state. Next one is the third state here, which is 10 cents. The vending machine has 10 cents. You could have reached here by putting in two fives or one 10. But if you are here and you don't give anything, both N complement and D complement, so you're not giving it anything, what do you have, what happens? It stays there. No nickel, no dime, no dime. Or, if you put in nickel or you put in dime, it will go to 15, right? So it is treating a dime as five here almost because we are not gonna give the change back. Nickel or dime, either nickel or dime, it goes to the state with 15 cents. When you are at 15 cents and you don't press reset, you stay there. Does that mean that you keep giving, I the you keep, giving more and more items? No, you give the item once and then you do not give any more items. You go back to the state zero after you press reset. So this is how it's going to work, right? So I'm going to erase these marks here and say, okay. So let's suppose this is a, let's suppose I, I, I'm operating this vending machine I press reset, I get to the zero states. Now the vending machine does not have any money. And suppose I have all the coins available to me and I want to reach to uh, the, the item as soon as possible. What do I do? I press reset, come to this state, zero cents. I put in a dime, I go here. And then from here, I put in a nickel, I go here. And that gives me the item. Right, but that item happens when I press reset or I I put in the um, so outputs here depend on present state, right? So the moment I I reach fifteen cents, that's when I'm going to get uh, the the output. But that transition happens at the clock edge. Another way of doing this would be to do nickel, nickel, and nickel. I still get that, right? So bottom line is 
that would be the state diagram which is representative of my uh, finite state machine, the vending machine, based on the assumptions that I made. Now, you can make this into a very, co very complicated finite state machine as well, where you can have a state for each cent, so zero cents, one cent, two cent, and so on. So you can have, you know, 16 particular states because it's going from 0 cents to 15 cents, right? So you can have all the way to 15 cents. So 16 possible states with increments of 1 cent. But that would be useless because you only have uh, nickel and dime. There's no need for doing that. Although one could do it that way, where the jumps are from 0 to 5 and 5 to 10 and so on, right? So that, the, what about the change in this case? In this particular example, the vending machine is keeping the change. It is not giving you anything back. But, but if you want to design a different finite state machine in which you have two different states, one for 15 and one for 20, and when you go to 20, you give back five, right? That could be another output. That is possible. But right now in a simple design, we are ignoring that. So one way of doing this, the simplest way of doing this with, with respect to the number of states is 0, 5, 10, 15. Or another way of doing this would be to include all the possible states 16 possible states between 0 and 15 cents with increment of 1 cent, which is, you know, still doable, but uh, redundant, like you are not going to be using many of the states in there. Alright, so the, that's about the state encoding. So here we use the states 0, 5, 10, 15. However, you could have used m uh, many more states to do this. Alright, uh, I think we are about time so let us stop here and we will continue with this example when we come back